now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear someone talking about art. Look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Listen to the first part and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first in this year's series of public lectures offered by the Art Gallery. As chief curator of the gallery, I was given the honour of presenting the first lecture, and let me tell you, I had a difficult time deciding what to talk about tonight. Being the curator, I naturally know just about everything that's in this gallery, but I wanted to choose an artist who has a wide appeal. That seems only fair, yes. But I didn't want to talk about someone so well known that anything I said would be familiar. I wanted someone modern. My personal preference is for modern art. But again, I wanted to choose someone who had the potential to appeal to all art lovers, whether they're attracted to traditional forms, impressionism, surrealism, or what have you. So, having spent the last five years as a visiting professor in Barcelona, it's not surprising that I finally chose to talk about one of the greatest Catalan artists, one whose work is likely to be familiar to many of you. Juan Miro. Look at this, and this, and this. Ring any bells? Miro's most famous and most widely reproduced works tend to be like this: bright primary colors with lots of asymmetrical forms. He painted on large canvases. Larger than himself, quite often, and his paintings depicted birds, trees, flowers, and other features of the natural world. But Miro produced a great variety of work, and it's about some of his lesser-known paintings that I would like to speak this evening. Miro was born in Barcelona in 1893, the son of a goldsmith. He began to show talent very early. And in 1926, went to Paris, where he was drawn to the surrealists of Montparnasse. He did not define himself as a surrealist, however. He preferred to stay free to experiment with other artistic styles as he wished. Miro had an intense dislike of much of the painting and many of the painters he knew. He wished to do something totally different, to express his contempt for bourgeois art. And yet, ironically, Miro's success has made his works much in demand among art collectors of the world. But we can't really talk about the artist without looking at his art, and that's what I'd like to do now—to take a look at just a few of Miro's works and think about what it is that makes them special, special to me, and to a great number of people who flock every day to the Miro Foundation in Barcelona. Now look at questions thirty-six to forty. As the lecture continues, answer questions thirty-six to forty. Let's start with this, one of Miro's best-known and brightest works, "Woman and Bird," a sculpture created in nineteen eighty-two. It is on display in a park in Barcelona, often known as the Juan Miro Park. A huge sculpture. 
towering up into the sky. It reflects Miro's eternal interest in these themes, as well as his more technical interest in materials. This sculpture is covered in mosaic, which gives it a naive and cheerful appearance. It is interesting that this sculpture was completed in 1982, just a year before Miro's death. I think it shows that, towards the end, he was feeling as playful as a young man, and I think he wanted to share this playfulness in a park on such a big, very public scale. And now, another representation of a woman, this time just called Woman. This was painted in 1976, a late work for Miro, and is a work we often see reproduced or on sale as postcards or posters in gallery shops around the world. So why is it so popular? I think the use of colour has something to do with it. People respond to these rounded shapes filled with primary colours, especially on a large canvas like this. Also, the fact that, while it is rather surreal, it is still possible to recognise the form of a woman and to see it as a sympathetic representation. It's a bold, bright painting, and I think that it awakens a reaction in many of us. And finally, something quite different, though still a woman. A harsh, even violent work that was completed in 1939 at a time when Miro was greatly influenced by events of the Civil War in Spain. It's titled Seated Woman 2, but it can be hard to find the woman here, as she's been transformed into a rather horrendous creature. So is that how Miro viewed women? As grotesque? Not at all. This picture can also be seen as strong, with a huge base and solid shoulders to support those who depend on her. In this painting, her arms and neck seem to grow as vegetation out of her shoulders, representing woman as a fertile ground, perhaps. We also see here the fish and birds, the moon and stars so typical of Miro's work, making her a creature of nature and of the heavens as well. And that's all we have time for this evening, I'm afraid. I hope that you've enjoyed this brief look at Miro's work, and that you will enjoy the other lectures that follow this one. Thank you, and good night. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Hi, this is Old Spob. I would very much appreciate it if you could like, subscribe and share this video, as this will enable me to help more old students reach their old goals. Very much appreciate it. Thank you.